not today uh, with certain common comments, which you'll find in all these five chapters. And particularly, we would be looking briefly at verse, uh, chapters 15 and 16 of John's Gospel. But I want to connect uh, those chapters so that you do not consider these five chapters as kind of disconnected from uh, one another. They're all connected, and the connecting medium is God the Holy Spirit. I want you to uh, recognize that. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, you remember, those of you who have been with us for the earlier session, you may remember that I mentioned that the Holy Spirit is not brought out clearly in chapters 13 and 17. But you see him being mentioned in chapters 14, 15, and 16. But the common feature here is the word love. And so we must remember, if you recall what I said on the first day, first of these three days, uh, that the person who pours the love of the Father into the Son and the love of the Son into the Father is the Trinity. So it is through the Spirit that the Father and the Son are one God, which is why I requested uh, this last song that we heard today. And uh, let me tell you something about uh, your own understanding of singing praise, worship to God. As you begin to reflect more and more deeply into Scripture, you will find that what we sing normally are only praise and thanksgiving songs. Worship is really being fascinated with God. It is as your fascination for God increases, you begin to reflect his character uh, in your lives, and you become a channel of blessing to others. And that is what I would like to encourage all of you. And those of you who feel you are poetically inclined and God has given you the gift of writing uh, scripts for songs, I think we need a whole new genre of songs, which take us beyond uh, a worship, praise and thanksgiving into something that is truly appreciating God for who he is. And that is my passion during these days, during many years now, for the last many years, I've come to see that God, when we say we are worshiping God, we are not doing it for our sake, which is why to say at the end of a worship service, we had a great time is almost blasphemous because worship is what we bring to God. It is not what you get out of it. That is a fringe benefit about which we don't even talk. And I think we have to change our vocabulary, change our whole attitude. What I'm going to do is to take you to John chapter 17 and read a few verses because this, in a sense, I mentioned that these five chapters uh, could be called uh, most sacred part of scripture and it's very dangerous to distinguish one passage of scripture from another. But John, when he's writing this gospel, he's probably in his 90s and the other gospels have already been written. And so the Spirit of God is bringing to the mind of John what uh, others have not mentioned. And these five chapters contain something which even the great Paul has not written about. And I'm going to read to you John chapter 17, verses 20 to 22. My prayer is not for them alone. And this is where we come into the picture. Jesus actually says, my prayer is not for these 11 disciples. Uh, it is not for, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that includes all of us, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, I want to tell you something about the grammar here, because the word one in English, when you read it, you would not know whether it is masculine, feminine, or neuter gender. Because in the Greek language, there are three separate words for one masculine, one feminine, and one neuter. Now, that is true in our South Indian languages. I'm a Tamil-speaking person, but I have become familiar with uh, all of our 
major languages. And if you look at um, Kannada and uh, Malayalam, for example, you will find that uh, they have very clearly three different words. A good example is uh, John 10, verse 30. It's a very short verse. Jesus says, I and my father are one. And even in that verse, the word one is in the neuter gender. Why is it significant that it is neuter gender? Now, let me tell you something about myself. Now, those of you who see me, you see that I have very less hair on my head. I don't comb my hair. I only arrange them. Now, suppose you see me after five years, and you see that I have lost the rest of my hair, and you ask me, are you the same fellow who did a series uh, in Open Up? If I were to speak in Greek or in German, uh, both of which languages have different words uh, for one in the three genders, I would say, I and the person whom you saw a few years ago are one. And I would use the masculine gender, which means we are one and the same person. Jesus is very careful that we do not confuse the person of the son with the person of the father. But both the father and the son belong to the same divine being. And that is one of the reasons why the neuter gender becomes very important. In Tamil, it is nanum pidavum odrairukrum, oruvanairukrum, ala. One dry crumb in Malaram, Nyanum Pidav Unahun. In Kannada, Nanu Tandayu Undagi Deve. You notice that in these languages, the North Indian languages, including Hindi, with which I'm in fact more familiar than with Tamil, May our Pita Ek Hai. Now, Ek Hai Hai is plural, but that Ek itself does not give you the indication whether it's masculine, feminine, or neuter. And so when we sang this chorus to the faith family, that we are one in the spirit. We are not one and the same person. We are many men and women here, but we are one body and we become the best reflection and the best illustration of the Trinity. So if you want to look for illustrations of the Trinity, we have to look at the church, at the human family. And I do not want to give other examples. Otherwise, I'll stray outside, uh, stray outside our topic. But who's the one who makes us one? And that is the Holy Spirit of God. He's the one who kind of stands behind. Let me refer to a verse which I talked about earlier. It is um, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, where Paul says, the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is a communicator of love not only among us believers, but he's a communicator of love even within the Trinity. Many years ago when we were living in Singapore, uh, there's a Methodist church called the Christ Community Methodist Church for whom I did a two-part series on the Trinity. And then they asked me to write an article on the work of the Holy Spirit in eternity. Now, I have never explored that topic, but I suddenly realized that before we were created, before angels were created, before anything was created, the Holy Spirit of God was still pouring the love of the Father into the Son, the love of the Son into the Father, constituting them as one divine being. And I want you to get hold of that because in one sense, I would like to dedicate our study today to the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Trinity whom we do not see, we can read about Jesus in the Gospels. We can read about God in the Old Testament. We can do a second person reading. You may remember I mentioned that. Uh, participate in the narrative and join the crowd of some 30 lakhs of men, women, and children and hear God speaking to us in an audible voice from Mount Sinai. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, and I'm sure that all of us, have would have definitely had some touch of the spirit but you know what he does is what the spirit of god does as jesus would say in john chapter 16 he does not speak of himself he brings glory to jesus the fact that we have come to believe in christ that we are born again as the first uh, the first group uh, sang for us and i want to tell you that is the work of the spirit it is through the Spirit we can cry to God as Abba, Father. 
And I want to tell you, Paul makes it very clear in Romans 8. He, if we, anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So we today can call God our Father only by the Holy Spirit. Now I want to highlight three roles of the Spirit. First from these uh, chapters, I want to take you back to chapter 14, which we saw yesterday. And I want to read a verse which I read yesterday, verse uh, 16 and 17, where uh, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. And now comes the important section, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I mentioned those two prepositions as very important. Uh, he's with you. He was with them before the day of Pentecost. All our Old Testament believers, he was extra personal, outside the person of the believer. But from the day of Pentecost onwards, his work becomes intrapersonal. He becomes, uh, he comes in us. Now, for example, in the same chapter, when you go to verse 20, on that day, you will realize, and that day is not when Christ comes again, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. When you have this in the picture, then when we come to chapter 15, and when we talk about abiding in the vine, you can make the connection. That's one reason why I always suggest, and in my own reading of the Bible, I, to, I try to read a chunk of scripture, at least three chapters. Some people uh, commit themselves to reading something between five to ten chapters. The more you read together, the better would be your understanding. And forget about chapter and verse divisions. And uh, forget about in our hard copies, the translators insert some titles. They are all very distracting because that is not how the Bible was inspired and written down because there is a continuous flow of thought which gets interrupted when you simply stop at one chapter, but we have to do that uh, for the sake of time and also for convenience of reference. But apart from that, chapter and verse divisions and headings of uh, certain passages can be a horrible distraction. Now I want to take you to John chapter 17 and look at what Jesus prays. We read a certain section of it uh, which I am going to read something more. Verse 21 of John 17. Uh, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That is the mutual indwelling of the Trinity. Now we are invited to be part of that fellowship. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Very interesting. We will come to that a little more clearly when we go to chapter 16, how the world will come to know that this big, uh, mysterious doctrine of the Trinity, which even our, we Christians cannot get our minds around, how can that indwelling of God in us is going to show the world that the Father has sent the Son. And that is something very, very important. I think I want you to look at it. 1, uh, 1 John 1 verse 3, in a different talk here on Open Up, I mentioned that, but I'm going to quote that verse, but substitute the word fellowship, which occurs twice in that verse, with the phrase, share a common life. One of the modern English translators, a British translator, New English Bible, uh, does not use the word fellowship because we all use that word, but we are not quite sure what it means. It means that we have something in common and look at what John says there. We proclaim these things to you so that you may share a common life with us. And we share a common life with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So what we call as eternal life is not just a quantitative living beyond our death. It is a qualitative participation in the life of the triune God beginning now when we are born again into the family of God. And so it is that uh, oneness that is in the Trinity, uh, which is now being shared with us by Jesus coming into the world as the historic person and now sending the Holy Spirit. 
to be with us. So let's have this at the back of our mind, which is why the work of the Holy Spirit, the anonymous person of the Trinity, is so central in our understanding. When you become conscious of the Lord Jesus in your time of prayer, in your time of reading scripture, or sometimes just out of the blue, you feel a sudden closeness to Almighty God, please remember all those experiences come to you through the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. You notice, and in fact, some of you have mentioned about my perverted sense of humor. You know, one of the things I have noticed is that um, humor is a very biblical thing. It's part of the image of God in you. As long as you do not play the joke on somebody else, as long as you play it on yourself, that is the safest uh, expression of humor. People have a complaint against me. What is it? LT does not make applications. What is my answer to that complaint? I am not here to make applications. You have to do it. I am here to tell you the truth about who God is. And it's for you to make the application. I don't want to tell you that when you get up in the morning, you should brush your teeth and you have, should have a shower. N.T. Wright rightly says, we have reduced the good news to good advice. Good advice is available in all religions. The fact that God is triune is part of the good news. If God is not Trinity, the Father would not send the Son into the world, and the Son and the Father will not send the Holy Spirit into the world. And so we begin to see that the good news is all about who God is, not just what he has done for us. That's a very selfish, uh, limited reading of the good news. Just to think that God sent the Son so that I'll escape hell. Important but not central. That is the first step. We are made like the only step. And we are all constitutionally different. Our DNAs are different. We are wired differently. The way the Holy Spirit works in me will not be the same way in which he works in you. Please remember, that's one of the reasons I don't give too much of what I call my testimony, except about the negative side of my testimony. If I get angry with my wife, and they say this in my cell group, there will be pin drop silence because uh, witnesses are supposed to be success stories. You are not supposed to share failures. And that is how we have brought a whole world of unreality around us. And our Christian experience is also equally unreal. Let us be real, real about our problems, real about our temper tantrums. Uh, let me tell you another story from our life uh, as a husband and wife. Uh, when we were, uh, we completed 25 years of marriage. I was working with RZM in Chennai, and the staff of RZM, mainly ladies, they invited us both to come, and we were to exchange garlands and all that. And after that, they asked us to do something which I have never done in my life. He asked both of us to say what we liked about our spouse and what we disliked about our spouse. And my wife, to my great shock, you know what she said? She didn't like about me. She said, when LT is angry, he is silent, and I don't like it. And I was wondering whether she would have been happy if I had thrown some cups and saucers around and expressed my anger. You know, I want to tell you that there is something about reality. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who brings reality. Reality in our experience of God, reality in assessing ourselves, bringing reality into our relationship with one another. And that is the best way to translate that the Father is in the Son, the Son is in the Father, and then they are in us, and we are in them. We share that same transparency which the Father and the Son experience through the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Please take that as the background. And now quickly, I'm going to mention three uh, main things that uh, Jesus mentions here. First is in chapter 14 about the work of the Holy Spirit. He says that, um, yes, he says, if you love me, verse 15, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you. You know, that very interesting that the NIV, the recent translation, 
uses the word advocate, it is the same word in the Greek parakletos. Parakletos man means the one who comes alongside, which John uses in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a defense lawyer. But here in chapter 16, what we are going to say, the paraclete becomes the lawyer for the prosecution, the public prosecutor, by, because through us, the church, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. That is the second role of the Holy Spirit. He helps us, the church, as a paraclete, but he also brings judgment to the world by our prophetic living in the world. The third thing that he does is to bring to our remembrance whatever Jesus has taught us. We must remember that the disciples, after the traumatic experience of the first Good Friday, would not have been able to remember many things that Jesus said over the years when the Gospels were written and culminating in the Gospel of John. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God brings to the mind of the disciples. And today, as I am preparing and speaking to you, as you are listening to me, we are all listening to the words of God, the Holy Spirit, interpreting his word to us and applying his word to us in our uh, respective lives and circumstances. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Please remember that without the Holy Spirit, that mutual indwelling of the Father and the Son would not take place. That takes me to chapter 15, where we have this word abide in the older English versions, and my more recent version uses the word remain, which is in fact a more literal translation of um, the Greek word meno, if you remain, remain in me. So remain, the branches remaining in the vine, the vine remaining in the branches connected, drawing the sap from the root through the vine, flowing into uh, the branches, and we bring forth fruit. Now, what does he say? Why does he want to say it? Because when you come down chapter 15, which is one of the reasons why I said, read uh, chunks of scripture. Because what is this fruit? Look at verse 17. This is my command, love one another. Paul would pick up the same thing. In Galatians 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, which expresses itself as joy, peace, long-suffering, faithfulness, etc. All the remaining eight words in the fruit of the Spirit are eight different expressions of love. Don't think of them as eight disconnect, nine disconnected uh, characteristics. And love, interestingly, I want to tell you, is something which makes you unself-conscious. The fruit of the Spirit um, is unself-conscious. The gifts of the Spirit are self-conscious. Uh, I don't want to go into that, but I want to tell you that when you are really reflecting the character of Christ, you will be the one who would be least aware of it. I want to, you know, when we were small boys, uh, every day when we came back from school, we used to ask our mothers, and of course, I grew up most of my school years were with my uncle, my periapa, in, uh, uh, in Raipata. He was vice principal of Meskin Training College, and we used to worship at Wesley Church, which was close by, and Good Shepherd Church, which was a little far, farther away. And uh, we used to come and ask, have I grown taller? And of course, uh, we used to draw a scale in the wall and measure ourselves against it. Don't try doing that, because you will never be able to know. In fact, you should not be able to know. Because when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was shining, but he did not know that his face was shining. Only others noted it. I want to tell you that the fruit of the Spirit, the resemblance that you come to bear uh, to Christ's character as you remain in the vine, which expresses itself as love for the saved, overflowing into love for the lost, that is unself-conscious. You are not aware of it. Take a quality like humility. The moment I think I am humble, I've ceased to be humble. Please remember, don't ever try to look at yourself and see, 
Let others say something about you. Let others encourage you. We, let me tell you a, a very interesting illustration. Many years ago in uh, Pune here, uh, you know, there was a, some of you might have heard of the magazine Light of Life, which comes from Mumbai. And the person who started it was uh, a lady, a missionary from Scotland, Jane McNally. And she uh, started it. And then I knew her in the 1960s. And then she went back to Scotland. In 1986, the Evangelical Fellowship of India had their annual conference here in Pune. And I was doing the Bible study. Jane McNally had returned to India for a visit. And she was in the audience. And when I met her, and of course, I was surprised to meet her. You know what she said to me? LT, you have grown. Nobody has ever said anything like that to me. Young or old. And she did not say this as a condescending person, a much older person telling a younger fellow, you have grown. She said it only to encourage me. I'm saying, why don't we say that to one another? You have grown. We normally say you have put on weight. But you can say, why don't you say you have put on spiritual weight? Help us to grow in Christ. And that is the oneness that we enjoy through the Spirit of God. I mean, all these chapters, I mean, you can go on talking about it, and I would miss uh, the line of thought that I want uh, you to take. But what uh, John is saying here in John 15, and the Spirit of God saying to us through John, that we have to abide in Christ so that we express the fruit of the Spirit. That is the sap of the vine which is now flowing into the branches. And the one word, as we saw from the very first day onwards, is what uh, John mentions in verse 17. This is my command, love one another. That means you will not be able to obey this command except by abiding in the vine. And of course, he explains that, but that's not our main topic. So I have to rush away to, to other things. And I also wanted to uh, mention this because when we got the news today, latest news, that Mr. Amit Shah uh, has been admitted to hospital because he has tested uh, positive for COVID. And uh, one of my friends from IJM said, how do we respond to this? And I said, of course, we should pray for him. And he said <laughs> very correctly, and I'm sure we all share the same sentiment. I said, uh, he said, my head says that to me, but my heart does not say that to me. But that's exactly the point. I said, when Jesus said you should love those who do not love you, he did not mean that we should hug them, like Mr. Rahul Gandhi hugged the prime minister in the Lok Sabha. One of the ways in which we express our love, and that's going to be part of our testimony, as a community of God's people in a country where we are not held in high esteem, where we'll constantly be under pressure. And that's exactly what Jesus says later in chapter 15. We respond by praying for people who persecute you. We'll be persecuted, but we shall not develop a persecution complex. We shall be martyred, but we will not uh, um, take on or assume a martyr complex. We will be called a minority, but we shall not be developing a minority complex. Please remember, it is the Holy Spirit of God who can begin to develop these qualities in us. I'm not saying that we should not represent the interests of Christians before courts of law, before the local authorities. Please do that. Fight for the rights of others. I've been saying that very often on this platform. So I'm not denying that. But I'm saying your attitude has to be something different. And all these chapters are about attitudes, applications you will have to make. And I want to, you to know that that is central to what uh, Jesus is saying. Now we come to chapter 16, where as usual, there's a little bit of theology here. I want to tell you in verse uh, 7 onwards, we are in chapter 16. Jesus says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. The advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, why does Jesus say that it is to your advantage that he's going away? Do a second person reading. Imagine yourself to be part of the disciples. And Jesus is saying, it is good for you that I go away. 
And I say to myself, oh, if I'm given the choice between the presence of the, of the Lord Jesus with me, I would prefer that. The presence of the Holy Spirit in me, I have no idea what it means. And I would gladly choose the presence of Jesus with me, whom I can listen to him, whom I can listen to, whom I can touch. Oh, wonderful. But why is it to our advantage? Two reasons. One, Jesus as a physical human being is still a physical human being at the right hand of the Father. Please do not forget that. Because we must remember that uh, Jesus assumes humanity forever. In the right hand of the Father, we have a human being. Paul in 1 Timothy 2.5. We have one God, one mediator between God and uh, humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Whenever Paul says Christ Jesus, he is affirming the humanity of Christ. Please remember, when he says Jesus the Christ, he is talking about a human being, Jesus, who by his being anointed is declared to be the Son of God with power. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. So you begin to understand that that is how we begin to read the scripture. We have a human being at the right hand of the Father. And that is why Jesus says, it is for your good that I am going away. Now I come to that passage, which I mentioned in passing. And we are going to stay in this um, passage for some time because it is extremely important for us to realize the depth of this statement. And this is another role of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 onwards, chapter 16. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong. I'm very happy that uh, they have translated this way. But if those of us uh, old people like me who grew up on King James Version, you would remember he will convict the world. That's exactly what it is. That's why I said the role of the Holy Spirit as prosecutor, as public prosecutor. He will convince or he will uh, prove the world to be in the wrong about three things, about sin, about righteousness, about judgment. But when you look at the following verses, Jesus, as usual, is very cryptic. He is not very explicit. Look at how he puts it. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world stands condemned. How do I read this? Normally, we all talk about the conviction of the Holy Spirit very often. Those of us who have spoken at evangelistic meetings, we pray sincerely, Lord, bring the conviction upon people that they would recognize that they need salvation, that they would be convicted of their sin, and they would see Jesus to be God and man, the Savior of the world. That's what we pray. But that's not the context here. In these five chapters, Jesus is saying the world will come to be convicted, to be proved in the wrong about sin, about righteousness and judgment through the church. Get hold of that. You forget all that I say over these three days. Take this. The world, by looking at the church, will have to be convinced or convicted of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And the moment you give that introduction, those three statements of Jesus become a slightly clearer, not very clear. What does he say about sin? Because people do not believe in me. I want to tell you that the great religions of Buddhism, Islam, and Hinduism, very religious. Now, in our own country, we are going to build a temple in Ayodhya. And in Hagia Sophia, you know Hagia Sophia was um, St. Sophia's Cathedral uh, in Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul. And uh, that, of course, was a church uh, till 1453. 
when the Ottoman Empire, when the Muslims uh, uh, kind of overcame uh, Constantinople and renamed the city Istanbul, and it remained a museum till a few days ago, because on the 24th of July, our present president of Turkey, Erdogan, converted that into a mosque because he conducted uh, Muslim prayers in, in that same church. Now, all this is happening now. I'm very happy that they are happening because now we are beginning to understand what the church is all about. The church is not a building. The church is the people of God, which is the central teaching of these five chapters. And it is through this people of God, the world is going to be convicted first of sin because the great religions of Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism, very religious, but do not teach you that God is holy. And once you have the absence of this very important understanding of God, and today when we are being accused of converting people, we need to tell them that conversion is not change of religion. Conversion begins with a change of mind about God, that he is holy, and the best of us and the worst of us stand condemned in his presence. And Jesus here says here, because they do not believe in me, because for the first century church, now Jesus is speaking only to the 11 disciples. When Jesus was here, like I said yesterday, a sinner could be condemned without Jesus speaking the word of condemnation. The woman caught in adultery stood convicted. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus did not respond to an altar call. In fact, if you look at the story of Zacchaeus in Luke's gospel, it looks as if Jesus is responding to the altar call. He invites himself to a meal in Zacchaeus' home. And then he proclaims before uh, Zacchaeus signs the decision card, he says, today salvation has come into this house. So he puts all our evangelistic efforts uh, right side up, let me put it that way. Because Jesus knew that Zacchaeus has come to understand what sin was. When he says, half my goods I'll give to the poor. And according to the Old Testament, remember Zacchaeus was a Jew. If I take something wrongfully from you, I should only return it twofold. That is the Old Testament requirement. But Zacchaeus says, I'll give it back fourfold. Fruits of repentance. Seeing something about the gravity of sin because you have come into contact with Jesus. But now Jesus is going away. How will the paraclete bring conviction about sin through the church when we begin to display something of the character of Christ in us, in our corporate lives? I'm not just speaking about our individual lives. We have individualized Christianity, which is such a horrible thing. I want to tell you, I always think of William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect, you know, some seven of them who were praying separately when Wilberforce was arguing in the commons against slave trade. And he was able to get that law passed. And just a few days before he died, he could get the good news from his prime minister that Britain had outlawed even slavery in the British Empire. Now, I want you to recognize that that is how the conviction of sin of this small group of people who are a horrible minority, even Christian members of the British Parliament were actually profiting from slave trade. How did God bring that conviction? Even when Jesus was physically absent through the people of God. Secondly, what is the second thing which the public prosecutor would do? Of a, a righteousness where you can see me uh, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me lo no longer. Of course, we can see him no longer, but how does Jesus preface this whole statement? The Holy Spirit will convict the world. And when Jesus goes away and we do, do not see him, and the world does not see him, the world will be convicted of righteousness only again through the church. Because we, we live 
uh, lives as a community. I want to tell you something about Rajat Sharma. Now, Rajat Sharma today owns a Hindi news channel called Aaj Tak, if I'm not mistaken. Many, many years ago, in the easternmost district of Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Teju. Of course, Teju district has now been divided into a few, and I can see some of you from Arunachal here. Good to see. And it was a weekend where the Arunachal government had invited many of the many uh, few journalists to come and do a report on Arunachal government. It was a weekend. Offices were closed. They had no. Teju is a very distant place. To reach there, I had to cross two rivers on an elephant. Nowadays we have bridges. And so what I did was I took Rajat Sharma and another journalist uh, separately, and I said. You guys are doing a great job doing this investigative journalism. Let me tell you something about us, government officers. You take 100 of us, 20 of them are totally corrupt. And in spite of all your writing, they can walk about in broad daylight in Connaught Place and nothing will happen to them. 80% of us are reasonably honest, but because of your investigative journalism, they will never take a decision in their lives. In the government, like in Indian mythology, there are 32 directions in which you can send a file so that you don't have to take a decision. And then I said 10% of us are honest. Some of them us try to be scrupulously honest. What is the fourth estate doing to encourage us? So Rajat Sharma said, oh, you should write for us. You should speak on our channel. Probably I should take him up one of these days. I don't know whether he remembers it. But I want to tell you, our country suffers from two groups of people. People who are dishonest, then people who are honest, who think they alone are honest. Who's the Bible character who comes closest to that? The prophet Elijah. I, only I am left. And God had to tell him there are 7,000 people who have not bowed their knees to Baal. Don't wear your righteousness on your shirt sleeves. Your righteousness comes across to the world in more subtle ways, not by talking about it all the time. And I do want to tell you, my years in the government, you know, one of my officers, I can say that it's the highest compliment paid to me. He said, sir, for us, LT means low tension. When we were working with you, taking such tough decisions, you made the committee meeting so relaxing that we were able to think clearly, and we were able to decide rightly. You know, righteousness comes across to people in ways you just cannot put your finger on. So don't wear your uh, righteousness on your shirt sleeves. Yesterday I told you about the Arnav Goswami, day before yesterday, the moral high ground. That is not how the world comes to know about righteousness. And thirdly, and in a sense, most importantly, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, if you go back to chapter 12, I don't want to take more time because I've still not gone into chapter 17. Uh, Jesus would say uh, the hour of darkness. In Luke's gospel, he says the hour of darkness. And in uh, John's gospel, chapter 12, he says, now is the prince of this world condemned. Chapter 14 of John's gospel, we didn't look at that verse. Uh, the prince of this world comes and he has no hold on me. I want to read to you two passages which are important. Uh, some of you who attended my previous sessions on other topics would have uh, heard me read from this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, where Paul goes out of the context in which he's writing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery uh, that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So the prince of this world has been judged on the cross. Another passage, Colossians 2, verses 13 to 15. Again, Paul goes outside the context of what he's saying there against legalism. And then he says something like this. When you are dead in your uh, since and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. 
he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Glorious verses. I want to tell you that all the struggles that we have today uh, with Satan, we must constantly remind ourselves of the right of scripture that we are fighting against a defeated foe. And that is why Jesus gave authority to cast out demons and to fight demons in our own lives. In fact, uh, I was telling my nephew over the phone just uh, about an hour ago, I said when we were growing up as young Christians, uh, we talked about victory over evil thoughts and very often they were about evil sexual thoughts. But we never realized that evil thoughts can also come when you refuse to pray for Amit Shah. We need to have victory over that also. And there also we need to conquer the devil. Please remember that. I mean, there's a total transformation. And that is why Jesus says, the, uh, the uh, prince of this world stands condemned in your life. In his life, he condemned and won victory over Satan. And that is why Pilate refused to change the title on Jesus' cross. Because instead of putting the sentence on Jesus' cross, he actually stated a matter of fact. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He became truly king. And he writes book. Jesus and the victory of God in the cross of Christ. I mean, there are those amazing thoughts. And now we are cross-bearing, self-denying followers of Jesus coming against thoughts which will always sow thoughts of hatred for those whom we do not like and those who do not like us. But asking the Spirit of God to pour His love into our hearts. So that is the role of the Holy Spirit. Now I want to jump to chapter 17 uh, because I want to read a few verses and you will notice that I would be emphasizing one particular word or a group of words. Let me read from verses 1 to 5. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Verse 10. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me uh, through them. Verses 22 to 24. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. What is the word that I emphasized? The group of words that I emphasized are built around uh, the word glory. And this is not the spectacular kind of glory which has gallery appeal to our publicity-oriented Christians. This will come as a shock. Jesus often refers in John's Gospel uh, to the glory of the cross. In the cross, I glory. I want to tell you that that is exactly what Paul says. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time. You know, I want to tell you that is where Satan stands defeated and that is where the triune God is exalted. You know how Jesus mentioned even about his crucifixion to, uh, to Nicodemus? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, even so the Son of Man should be lifted up 
and lifting up an Old Testament phrase which occurs very often uh, means glory. But Jesus was talking about his crucifixion, which was even physically similar to the brazen serpent which Moses puts up in the desert. So what we are seeing here is this is the glory. I want to tell you two types of glory here. The glory, even in verse 10, which I read, is a glory which the disciples brought Jesus by doing what he sent them to do. So there is a glory which A brings to B. That is a glory which you can talk as a transcendent glory that I, you and I bring to God, that the Open Up group is bringing to God, arranging these series of talks from many of us. And then the glory that one enjoys with another. And that's a kind of an ecstatic glory. You know, when I've been speaking to you, and I'm happy that some of you have switched on the video, because when I look at you, I see the glory in both these uh, ways. One is the glory that, by inviting me, in a sense, you have brought me honor. And by responding to you, I have uh, brought you honor. That is one glory. But the other glory is the fact that we enjoy because we are part of the same family, as I look at the smiling faces on some of you. And that is an imminent glory. So glory, and one of the things we really miss during these lockdown days, is not being able to see people physically, to greet them, to shake hands with them. And you see, we begin to see this weakness, and that's one of the reasons why physically meeting is important, although the fact that we have to not only just abide by the government restrictions, it's in our interest, it's in the interest of other people, that we must comply with what the government is saying. But what I'm trying to say here is that, that both types of glory you should think about. Because we very often think about what I can get out of God, which is one horrible thing. We must get out of that mindset. Then we also begin to think what um, we can get out of others. You know, when I was a new Christian, one of our leaders told us, Jesus taught us to love people and use things. But we love things and use people. And so for more than 30, 40 years, I've stopped praying to God, Lord, use me. It is a horrible prayer. You don't see that uh, in the Bible. You see that in many hymns and writings of great people. But of course, they have written it with a clear conscience. But it's using things. You mean to say God is saying now LT is now giving his heart and soul into these Bible studies. I'm going to squeeze him and extract the last drop of blood out of him. Is that what our God is? That is the idea we have. I'm going to exceed uh, the time a little bit, and so then you'll have to put up with me. I, I, I was speaking to a, a large group of Christians, what, about 2,000 people. And I shocked them by reading from uh, Luke chapter 17, where Jesus says, when you have done all these things, you should say, we are unprofitable servants. Verse 10 of Luke 17, which is better translated and other places, it occurs four times in the New Testament, that Greek word. But in that particular context, it means non-indispensable servants. So I gave them an example. Uh, I was posted to Shillong when uh, Assam Valley was under this anti-Bangladesh agitation. You could not do anything in the government world. And our member of the postal board, a Tamil Brahmin, K.V. Srinivasan, came to visit us. I was superintending engineer from the civil side. Then we had uh, a Mizo gentleman who was director of postal services. And then we had Mr. Bhatnagar who was director of telecom. So he had a meeting with the three of us. And nobody would speak boldly to their senior officers. I would speak to them. I told them, sir, you come from Delhi and you speak to us as if this whole area is an a total ocean of discipline. I want to tell you this is a total confusion. You know it, I know it, it's all in the papers. And we are trying to do something. And when we do the right things, we have absolute pin drop silence from New Delhi. But when the small thing goes wrong, all heaven and hell breaks loose. You know what K.B. Srinivasan told me? That is the missionary spirit. This is a Tamil Brahmin telling a born-again Christian 
that is the missionary spirit i will never forget that never forget that not in this life not in the life to come that means you should be willing to be taken for granted you are doing only your duty that's what draw my drew my attention to luke 17 verse 10 that what we will tell jesus you know george bernard has said you have to blow your own trumpet because nobody else is going to blow it for you <laughs> but uh, jesus says tells uh, something else don't blow your trumpet after you have done all this you should say we are non indispensable servants we have done only what it was our duty to do you know i want to tell you that that is the environment in which we are working we are going through difficult times some of you i can see some of you who are struggling through a very remote part of india for many years close to 50 years and i want to tell you that when you are tempted to self pity suggest to yourself we are doing only what is our duty to do we are not doing anything more than that and that is how the world will come to know that not, we are not only bringing glory to god but we are also uh, we are also uh, enjoying our one another our fellowship with one another you know i definitely believe that this lockdown has brought out some amazing innovations from many of you including your uh, the group of uh, open up that uh, such meetings become possible but i also want to tell you that when we begin to meet like this across boundaries otherwise we had to actually physically travel to places a b and c in order to meet with you but now we are able to look at one another and we are able to enjoy the glory that we have in Christ Jesus in one another and as we pray for one another we are bringing glory to God and glory to one another we are honoring one another you know please remember that when we pray for others we are actually glorifying the person for whom we are praying we are treating them with special honor and that is why during this pandemic with many groups praying groups going around we must remember this i'm going to read a verse to you from john 17 which is very interesting which ties up with something which we saw yesterday i'm reading verse 9 of john 17 i pray for them i am not praying for the world but for those you have given me for they are yours now that's very interesting jesus is very clear that he is not praying for the world he is only praying for us the writer to the hebrews says the same thing hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 he lives forever to intercede for us the church then who will pray for the world we will pray for the world remember yesterday we saw the third disciple judas not iscariot asking jesus why is it that you show yourself only to us and not to the world because we are the ones who will show jesus to the world we saw that in chapter 15 today that when the spirit of god comes he will convict the world of sin of righteousness of judgment through the church remember what i said yesterday god decided to give to humans the responsibility of looking after his creation the fall occurred the crucifixion pentecost and now god is continuing the same thing he will do his work in the world only through his people and that is where this becomes so important and i want to tell you something because i requested i'm going to stop here because i do not want to get into a new topic it's already 8:45 and what i suggested to sudan is um, to have a separate q and a on a saturday morning because on, once in a while you have that and for all these three days and if you reflect on it and if you want you can come back to that because i want to say something more uh, before we close today now those of you who do not uh, belong to liturgical churches i would suggest to you that you should download two creeds from the internet one is called the nicene creed i mentioned to you about um, istanbul which used to be constantinople 
And the Council of Nicaea, which met in 325 AD, met in a suburb of Istanbul called Nicaea. And I had the privilege of speaking in a small group of Turkish believers some years ago. It is on east of the Bosporus, you know, that narrow strip of water which uh, separates the European side of Turkey from the Asian side of Turkey. Um, uh, it is in Nicaea, that's where uh, when Constantine, Constantine, strictly speaking, did not make Christianity the official religion. He took the first step by making Christianity one of the acceptable religions. Judaism was already acceptable uh, in the Roman Empire, but now Christianity, uh, an emperor of some 60 years down the line, is the one who made Christianity uh, really a kind of a state religion. But uh, these three and two bishops got together and uh, wrote down the Nicene Creed, particularly to emphasize uh, the uh, divinity of Jesus. That was the main agenda. A few centuries later, uh, there was a creed centuries called the Athanasian Creed. Although Athanasius was Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt in the fourth century. But the thoughts of the Athanasian Creed, which you should also download, which is now very rarely read, in the real Anglicans, which follow the uh, Book of Common Prayer from the Church of England, they used to read it in two, on two occasions um, during the calendar year. But I want to now quote the paragraph about the Holy Spirit uh, in the Nicene Creed. And I want to tell you that um, I would like to even dedicate our session today to God the Holy Spirit because I mentioned the Spirit of God several times during our study. And this is how that paragraph runs. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. Now, where did the church get the inspiration from this particular way of formulating the statement about the Holy Spirit. Please turn with me to Revelation 22. I would like all of you to look at it uh, because it's a very beautiful verse. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Please remember, throne, singular, not thrones. If you go to chapter 5, on the throne there is one who is seated, but in the center of the throne is the Lamb who has been slain. And so from the Father and the Son proceeds the river of the water of life. What did we read in the, in the uh, Nicene Creed? Proceeding from the Father and the Son. It's taken straight from this. The author of life is the river of life through whom we are born again, through whom we are continuing to enjoy fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And it's a glorious thing. You know, for me, um, reading the creeds is part of my worship time because it brings me out of myself, out of my needs, my problems, whatever, into the very presence of God. Because it's a simple statement about who God is and how we need to soak ourselves in such a kind of a reflection. And that is why uh, you find that uh, in the uh, closing verses of Numbers chapter 6, God says to Aaron through Moses, the way he should bless his people. And in the earlier verses, uh, Jehovah is mentioned three times. And after that, what God says to Moses, and you shall put my name upon them. Shall we receive the blessing? The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon us now and always. Amen. Thank you.